Welcome to Concept in Medicine. In today's session, we are going to be looking at scalp injuries. But before we start, let me take the time to answer the question in our previous session. The question is, why is it advisable to suction the mouth before the nose during the resuscitation of a newborn? The answer is, newborns are nasal breathers. So suctioning the nose first will stimulate respiration where the baby will aspirate anything in the oropharynx and that could cause aspiration pneumonia. So suctioning the mouth first will remove all these impurities and foreign body in the oropharynx by then when the nose is being suctioned there will be nothing left in the oropharynx when the baby is stimulated to breathe through the suctioning of the nose. So with regards to that, that would help to prevent aspiration of foreign bodies in the oropharynx. That explains why it is advisable to suction the mouth first before the nose during neonatal resuscitation. And I believe we've gotten the answer right in the commentary session. Okay, let's move on by looking first at the layers of the scalp. So with the layers of the scalp, there is a sweet mnemonic to easily remember, and that sweet mnemonic is scalp. Okay, the layers of the scalp as I've drawn here, from the outermost to the innermost, we have the skin and the dense connective tissues together as you can see here then the next layer below the skin and the dense connective tissue is the epicranial aponeurosis the epicranial aponeurosis as you are seeing is also known as gallia aponeurotica then below the gallia aponeurotica or the epicranial aponeurosis is the loose areola connective tissues and below the loose areola connective tissue is the periosteum or also known as pericranium because the periosteum covers the cranium so another name for it in that regard is the pericranium now back to the mnemonic so we have the layers as described here so we said to easily remember use scalp so with the scalp the s stands for the skin the c in the scalp stands for the connective tissues which are dense the A refers simply to the aponeurosis, that is the epicranial aponeurosis or the gallial aponeurotica. Those are synonyms. Then the L is the loose areola connective tissue, that's the L. Then finally the P, which goes for the periosteum or what we call the pericranium, since it's covering the skull bones. Now, let's move ahead and talk about the types of the skull injuries using diagrammatic expression so in these regards we are eliminating the connective tissues so the first layer here is the skin followed by the gallia aponeurotica what we call the epicranial aponeurosis followed by the periosteum and finally the skull bone so if we have accumulation of fluid in between the skin and the gallia aponeurotica or you have a swelling which is resulting from fluid accumulation in between the skin and the gallia aponeurotica we call that caput sucedaneum the next one if there's bleeding into the potential space between the gallia aponeurotica and the periosteum then we refer to that as subgallial hematoma why are we saying subgallial because the bleeding is occurring below the gallia aponeurotica layer then finally if the bleeding occurs in the potential space between the periosteum and the skull bone then we will refer to it as a subperiosteal bleeding but again it has a special name and what is that special name we refer to that as cephalohematoma okay let's move ahead and look at the types of the scalp injuries into details we will start by looking first at the caput sucedaneum. So when we say caput sucedaneum, we want to look at first the nature of the injury. So for the caput sucedaneum, it is a soft edematous 
scalp swelling resulting from the accumulation of fluid in between the skin and the gallial aponeurotica meaning it is occurring above the gallial aponeurotica it is occurring above the epicranial aponeurosis the next feature is we want to talk about the extension for carpus sicidanium it crosses that is the swelling crosses the suture line and the trick about whether the swelling crosses the suture line or not is that any swelling which is resulting from accumulation of fluid or blood in a space above the periosteum will definitely cross the suture line because if you are below the periosteum the periosteum is continuous with the endosteum of the skull bone so it limits the movement of the accumulation so any swelling which is resulting from accumulation of fluid of blood below the periosteum will not cross the suture line but the moment is above the periosteum it shall cross the suture line so in that case capus is danium the swelling is above the periosteum specifically where in between the skin and the gallia aponeurotica so with that it crosses the suture line now let's move ahead you should know again that caput sucedanium is associated with head molding when we say molding simply is the overlapping of the bones of the fetal skull so as to present the least of diameter into the pelvic inlet during labor all right then the next thing we want to talk about is the onset for caput sucedanium the onset is immediately after birth it is detected immediately after birth and the question is what causes caput sucedanium caput sucedanium is caused by the pressure of the dilating surface on the fetal scalp during labor which prevents venous and lymphatic drainage and that is the reason for the swelling in Capus sedanium. Let's move ahead and talk about the complications. For Capus sedanium, it does not usually result in complication. Then, for the treatment of Capus sedanium, it is going to be by observation only. You only observe. There is no intervention required. No intervention required. And for the prognosis of Capus sedanium, it is always good. Why? Because it resolves within the first few days of life that is after birth all right let's move on and talk about the second type of the scalp injuries which is going to be the subgalial hematoma which we said that it occurs in the potential space between the gallia aponeurotica what we call epicranial aponeurosis and the periosteum it means it's going to be below the galea aponeurotica that is why we call it subgalial hematoma so let's begin by talking about the nature so for the nature of subgalial hematoma we will say that the blood accumulation occurs in the potential space between the epicranial aponeurosis and the periosteum and for the subgalial hematoma it is usually a fluctuant boggy mass which mostly develops over the occiput you will see it mostly over the occiput that is for subgalial hematoma for the extension for the subgalial as you can see it is occurring in the potential space between the galea aponeurotica and the periosteum meaning it is above the periosteum and as we initially said any accumulation above the periosteum will definitely cross the suture line so subgalia hematoma definitely it crosses the suture line and may obscure the front tunnel now let's move ahead and talk about the onset for the subgalia hematoma it's the development is gradual that is it is insidious so because of that it is usually detected 12 to 72 hours after birth but in severe cases or in severe conditions it can be detected immediately after birth let's talk about the cause of subgalial hematoma for the cause of subgalial hematoma it results from the rupture of the emissary veins 
Then the question is, what are the mucillary veins? For the mucillary veins, there are connections between the scalp veins and the dura sinus. And the rupture of these emissary veins is precipitated by ventus assisted delivery. All right, let's move on and talk about the complications. For the complications, since there is blood accumulated, it could result in hemorrhagic shock. It could also give rise to significant hyperbilirubinemia since the red blood cells are going to be hemolyzing, giving off hemoglobin as a substrate for the synthesis of bilirubin. And the levels will increase, giving rise to the hyperbilirubinemia. In such a child, it must be observed for jaundice. Then, another complication could be anemia. Let's move ahead and talk about the treatment. For subgalial hematoma, there is going to be vigilant observation over the days to detect the progression. In some cases, especially the severe cases, blood transfusion and phototherapy may be needed. For the prognosis of subgalial hematoma, in the absence of complications, the prognosis is usually good. Now, let's progress and look at the last type of the scalp injuries. Let's move on and look at the last type of the scalp injuries. That will be cephalohematoma. With the cephalohematoma, with the nature, we are going to have a subperiosteal bleeding between the periosteum and the scalp bone. Why are we saying subperiosteal? Because it's going to be in the space or the region below the periosteum. Okay, you should also know that the cephalohematoma is usually a unilateral swelling, most commonly over the parietal bone and may be seen occasionally over the hospital bone. Let's move ahead and talk about the extension. For cephalohematoma, it does not cross the suture lines. Why? Because it is occurring below the periosteum, that is between the periosteum and the scalp bone. And the periosteum is continuous with the endosteum of the scalp bone, hence limits the bleeding. So with that, it will not be able to cross the suture line. The onset for cephalohematoma, it develops slowly. It develops over hours to days. Because of that, the swelling is not seen immediately at birth. It takes time for it to develop. Let's move on and look at the cause. For cephalohematoma, it is as a result of the rupture of the small blood vessels crossing the periosteum, secondary to the pressure on the fetal head during birth. And that pressure may be coming from an assisted vaginal delivery. And note that forceps delivery has a greater chance of causing cephalohematoma than vacuum delivery. Prolonged labor and macrosomia are other risk factors responsible for cephalohematoma. Let's move on and talk about the complications. With the complications, since there is bleeding, it could lead to anemia, it could also lead to hypotension, and finally, hyperbilirubinemia due to the hemolysis of the red blood cells. Let's move ahead and talk about the treatment. For cephalohematoma, the treatment is solely observation, solely observation. But in the cases where there is severe anemia or hypotension, blood transfusion may be necessary. And also, surgery, which is a rare modality of treatment for cephalohematoma, may be required if there are large calcified hematomas in cephalohematoma. If there is large calcification of the hematoma, then surgery may be required, but it is rare. And also, for cephalohematoma, aspiration should not be done in cephalohematoma. Why? Because one, the accumulation is usually made of blood clots, hence it's difficult to aspirate. Two, aspirating it may introduce infectious agents into the hematoma. Then three, it may result in abscess formation after the introduction of these infectious agents. So aspiration of the hematoma is not needed 
and cephalohematoma. Then finally, the prognosis. Cephalohematoma usually resolves over weeks. If I say over weeks, it may extend to months, but usually resolves over weeks with residual calcification. So those are the types of the scalp injuries. Once again, we said that if you have the fluid accumulation in between the skin and the gallia podneurotica, we call that caput sucedaneum. If the bleeding is occurring in the potential space between the gallia podneurotica and the periosteum, then we refer to that as subgallial hematoma because it's occurring below the gallia aponeurotica. And finally, if the bleeding is occurring between the periosteum and the scalp bone, then we call that cephalohematoma, which is a form of subperiosteal bleeding. And we said that any bleeding or any swelling above the periosteum will be able to cross the suture line. That is why for caput sidanium and subgallial hematoma, they are able to cross the suture line. But any swelling or bleeding below the periosteum, where you have the periosteum being continuous with the endosteum of the scar bone, the swelling is limited and hence does not cross the suture line. That is why cephalohematoma does not cross the suture line. I believe we've learned something new today. But before we leave, I have a question. The question is, why is it not advisable to vigorously suction the back of the throat during neonatal resuscitation? You may leave your answers in the commentary session. Kindly make sure to subscribe to my channel, like, share, and also comment the next concept you would like to see in my next tutorial session. My name is Dr. Dell, and once again, this is Concept in Medicine. Bye-bye.